My name is Dr. Ruth Mary Allen, and this is my podcast, Brain Health Unchaining Your Pain. Our world has become a minefield for our children to get the best out of their brain and whole body health, which is why I founded the Wellbeing Warrior Academy to help them navigate this minefield effectively. Right now, if you go to www.wellbeingwarrioracademy.com and use the code PODCAST10, you can get 10% off all programs. That's www.wellbeingwarrioracademy.com and use the code PODCAST10 at checkout. Now, let's get back to this week's episode of Brain Health Unchaining Your Pain. Welcome to the show, Brain Health Unchaining Your Pain. I am really looking forward to this discussion because we've got the amazing Leo Treadwell on the show. Welcome to the show, Leo. Thank you. I appreciate being here. I'm so glad that you've joined us. And for those that don't know Leo, he's been called the Darwin of human development because of his creation, autobiographical feedback, um, which is a new peak performance linguistic technology that leverages recent breakthroughs in brain plasticity epigenetics and cellular regeneration. I love all of these things with ancient human development technologies from the past. So important that we don't forget all of that as well. And he's had the honor and privilege of sharing the stage with some amazing people, including uh, organizations as diverse as Dr. Jane Goodall, Nelson Mandela, Dr. Deepak Chopra, um, the US Navy, Navy's Leadership Academy, and First Nations tribe throughout the US and Canada. So really um, diverse conversations and, and presentations that you had. And I'm really super looking forward to this conversation uh, around um, brain health and, and your approach to it. But before we dive in to your story, I'd love to know what you are passionate about in life right now. Oh, wow. Well, I would say primarily, I think that uh, it's the same passion I've had for about 30 years, which is what we're going to do when we see a convergence of begins to overtake humanity. And uh, finally, there's a listening for what I've been talking about for 30 years, because I think it's really in everybody's face as of the last two months with a uh, chat GPT and some other pretty major significant breakthroughs around quantum computing and um, many other things that are going on at the same time right now. Yeah, and I, do you know, I think that's really, in, I think it's really interesting because we kind of, you know, life has evolved to a certain point. Now we have technology on top and technology can either help us or hurt us depending on how we leverage it. And the power of quantum computing and the, ability of artificial intelligence to really enhance our knowledge of ourselves and also accelerate our performance is something that we've not really fully tapped into yet. It's, we're kind of like on the cusp of doing that uh, and rewriting how we approach um, optimizing our health and well-being in the first place and moving away from the traditional model that perhaps we've, we've been used to. Yeah, I think that uh, the, the choices we make right now, the questions we ask are going to be, you know, extremely important to show which direction we're going to be going in the very near future. Yeah, yeah. And I'd love to know for you in the context of your life's journey, which we're, I know we're going to dive into shortly, is what does optimal brain health mean for you personally? Well, so the human brain is capable of doing about 100 billion computations per second. And uh, we know that in each one of our cells, uh, we can hold up to, well, we know that in each one of our cells, we have DNA, and those, that DNA can hold up to 215 petabytes of information per gram. So at the moment, our, our conscious use of our, our brain and our body mind is extremely underutilized. And I would say that the optimum brain health would begin with understanding who we are in relationship to our environment, because I think that uh, we are also, we've lost our way in understanding our connection to the environment and understanding the reflective nature of this virtual reality that we live within. So if we were to ask a good neuroscientist or a good quantum physicist to come together and describe the human body, 
Uh, it was the chief of staff at Harvard Medical School back in the 90s who said uh, we would be called a non-localized self-referring cybernetic feedback loop. And what's that mean? It means that every part of our body is actually vibrating on and off many, many times, many, many, many times a second. And it's vibrating out to the end of the known universe and then collapsing back, vibrating out, collapsing back. So we're non-local by nature. So non-local, because we're non-local, we're also in a state of self-referral. Everything that we see is an aspect of ourself. We're not static. We're completely uh, in a state of constant flow. We know that the hydrogen, helium, nitrogen, and oxygen atoms that we breathe in are, uh, or molecules that we breathe in, those are the fundamental building blocks of everything on Earth. We're connected to all of this stuff all of the time. And yet we see ourselves as separate, which I think, you know, if we look at how our unconscious mind works in relationship to relationship, as an example, if we give somebody a gift, we can see that our serotonin levels rise just like the person we gave the gift to. We can observe a gift being given and our serotonin levels will rise the same as the gift giver and the same as the person who's given the gift. We can close our eyes and vividly imagine being in love and notice that the chemicals, if we do a salivary sample, will we'll shift towards more oxytocin and serotonin. If we get super angry at somebody, close our eyes and visualize that person, we'll create more entropic tendencies inside of our salivary sample. So our unconscious mind recognizes this connection between us and everyone else. That's why, why when we're feeling frustration towards somebody, that just the feeling of it is causing damage to ourself, not to the other person. Right. Yeah. So I think uh, understanding our relationship to who we are in relationship to our environment is probably the biggest aspect of brain health. We can see on the planet that the... the uh, the rivers and streams are like the circulatory system. The tectonic plates are like the skeletal system. The mycelium and the root systems are like the global brain. We can see the lymphatic system is like the swamplands. The respiratory system is like the rainforest. Well, if we look at the human body, even going all the way back to ancient texts, we're really more like a mobile immune system. Yet, we can see from ancient Greek philosophers through Thomas Jefferson to people walking around today that will say, well, human beings are more like a cancer walking on the planet than we and are. More like a cancer. More like a cancer. Yeah. Yeah. We're, you know, we're destroying our host. We're like the yeah. immune system gone mad. So what does this tell us about our relationship of how we see ourselves to our environment around us? Mm -hmm. Maybe that's why we have this massive outbirth of people who want to become healers and coaches and teachers and facilitators right now because we're waking up to like, whoa, wait a second. That's really what I'm supposed to be, is I'm supposed to be here to bless the waters and to give energy to the plants and to understand that my intention affects not only the subatomic world from Heisenberg's uncertainty principle of the double slit experiment to entanglement to mirror neurons, but also actually in physical tests we can do with plant life to notice that our intention can actually affect growth factors that it can affect that in plants, that it can affect that in our significant other, our children, or, or what have you. Um, so that's a big piece. We keep walking around thinking that we're separate, and that's probably the biggest antithesis to brain health, in my opinion. Long answer, I know. I apologize. No, no. And I honestly, I was grinning from ear to ear because I absolutely love that answer because it's one of the five pillars of brain health that we completely and utterly overlook. Um, is that connection to ourselves internally and also the connection to others and the environment like you mentioned and I, and, and I really want to dive into this because I just find this fascinating is I I've talked about it with other people on the show but we come from the earth and we go back to the earth so we're kind of transient in nature but, but also we are also a host of a whole ecosystem that sits within us, that has to work together. So we, we, a whole ecosystem that sits within ourselves, including how our brain functions and our whole body, is dependent on tr trillions of bacteria and mi microorganisms that reside within our gut and, that, and, and also you know, transition throughout our body. So we're kind of like the earth to a whole biodiverse, <laughs> Set of organisms that's way more than anybody on the planet um 
Uh, and we're all, all almost just the, and I'm not, not talked about this, but it just made me have a, a, a moment of aha moment, is we're almost that interface between the internal ecosystem that is, in essence, we're the host of, and that external ecosystem that we are absolutely dependent upon. But we, and, and, but we forget that, don't we? We kind of forget that we are, are just part of the whole system uh, and, a, and a host instance, to a whole other world of um, connections that's going on internally as well. And we destroy ourselves internally by what we consume, plus are destroying our world externally, which is ultimately causing what we can see in the world now is, you know, catastrophic problems from a health perspective, but also the wide, the, the whole ecosystem perspective. What, what's your <laughs> Well, you know, I, uh, I think it's interesting because we have so many sciences that we quote unquote understand, but we're not implementing into our lives. Yeah. And I, it's imperative that we go from the information age to the implementation age immediately. So when we take a look at something like the Mandelbrot set, we understand that as above, so below. We can look at the symbol uh, for the American Medical Association, which is the Kadashis, which was held by Hermes. And Hermetic law is as above, so below. That's where it begins. Everything that's happening in the microcosm is happening in the macrocosm. And I was having a conversation with my wife today after we left the gym. We're on the way to the beach this morning. And I said, you know, isn't it interesting because one of the programs we're leading right now, a component of that program is called the Master's Path. And that includes uh, doing daily breath work, meditation, and intermittent fasting. Because those practices create an environment that's conducive for massive growth inside of the body. Our growth hormone levels rise. Uh, we can see that the uh, free radicals begin to exit the body through the lymphatic systems, through the deep diaphragmatic breathing. Free radical scavengers increase. Telomeres increase on our DNA, on, on the stem cells. Stem cell production goes up. Hormonal balance comes into place. And it's like, wow. So just by calming our mind, taking deep diaphragmatic breathing and intermittent fasting frees up this energy that allows for our internal system to regenerate on a massive scale. Yeah. Well, take a look at that externally. If we stop eating, stop consuming, stop rushing around in the world outside, it's going to give time for the world outside to regenerate exactly in the same way as it's happening internally when I do the same process internally. Yeah. So the mirror is indisputable, absolutely indisputable, the reflection of, of the internal and external. In fact, I often tell people the only way out of this mess is in. <laughs> is to go in. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I agree with you, and I think we we seem to have massively lost um, the connection to ourselves because we don't give ourselves that permission to pause and take the, that time to look at ourselves internally. It's, you know, as you mentioned, it's the rush, 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 uh, and, and no time to truly connect with ourselves internally and also to connect with the world outside and use it to our advantage rather than to see it as a, almost a hindrance. Um, to 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 our well-being, but I, you know, with that in mind, I'd love to dive into your story um, that led you to the um, to where you are now, which is the autobiographical feedback that you do now. But it, where your journey started, where that connection um, was kind of broken in a way, um, if you wouldn't mind taking us back to where your journey sure. really started. Well, you know, I. Um I don't know if I really had a connection before coming to Earth because uh, the, as we know from our, uh, you know, what, what creates a young person, the formative years of a young person, a lot of that takes place inside of the womb, specifically third trimester, and then somewhere between six and nine years old, that, you know, that creates our hard wiring for the most part, it's not totally hard wiring, it creates our emotional expression. And I had a very tough uh, childhood because, uh, one, I, I wasn't wanted. Uh, my mother, you know, had an unwanted pregnancy. And 
my father certainly wasn't interested. And uh, at that time, you know, I'm in my 50s right now. So back in the 60s, that was a very uncomfortable position for a young woman to be in, which my mother was in. And that made, what took her from being in high school and being connected to everybody to wanting to distance herself and, and not be a part of anything for fear of projections and gossips and so forth. So coming out of the womb, uh, being in a space that was uh, an embarrassment to my mother and uh, not her not knowing or having the support system around or knowing how to deal with a situation like that, it was very difficult for me. So I think I grew up primarily in disconnection, which led to a rebellious teenage years and you know trying to find my own way and trying to find some connection. Well, for whatever reason, you know, I ended up leaving home at age 15, uh, got into a lot of trouble as a youth and decided I was going to prove myself by being successful in the traditional form of success. Mm -hmm. So, you know, by, by age 15, I purchased a sailboat to live on, which was really cool. Uh, by 16, I purchased a convertible and I was trying to like mirror myself after the Miami Vice show, you know, back in the late eighties, having a sailboat and a cool car, being a young kid with my role model was TV. And, um, you know, I went from there to, you know, I didn't, I didn't afford all those things by having a legal job working at Burger King. So I had, you know, some extracurricular activities that, uh, Ended up having me just building superficial value from uh, unhonorable methods. Okay. You know, eventually I ended up weaving that with some of the intellect that I had and the drive that I had. I got hired as a corporate trainer by a, by really a, gam a gamble, a bet. I, uh -huh. I basically swindled my way into a corporate training position by uh, putting my area supervisor in a bad spot, but then being a man and he agreed to, if I could make him do this, he would do it. So he hired me and I ended up opening six restaurants by age 19 in California. Wow. And then uh, from there, my reputation took me to getting a job at uh, the over largest over the counter brokerage firm in the country, selling stocks and bonds and so forth, training too. Um, but then I ended up Right before I was taking my test for my Series 7, they found out that I had a felony. I had stolen an airplane from the state patrol office, a small plane, and uh, they found out Just about that. Just a small plane. Small plane, uh, which luckily was the only thing I got in, I got caught for because uh, there was many other things that I had done that could have probably gotten me in even worse trouble than that. But uh, eventually... Uh, so I left that. I left the brokerage firm, and I then I went and I bought a small business. I built that business, and by age twenty-five, I'd sold my first business. And at the same time, I was diagnosed with a tumor on my back, and that was discovered because I went in, had some pain in my lower back, um, and I ended up having a tumor about the size of a softball in between my lower lumbar and my and my sacrum, pressing down on my sciatic nerve. And wow. I was simply told, "You should go." Uh, you should come back in as soon as possible and get this removed. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear anything else. And I walked out of the hospital. I remember walking out, giving God the finger and saying, you know what? I'm done. I've uh, been working my butt off. Uh, at, at that point, it's kind of difficult to describe the emotions that I felt from, you know, being a kid, teenager, trying to, uh, to, to show that I'm, you know, financially successful going down a windy path, blending my path with illegal activities, trying to get my head above water so I wasn't involved with illegal activities. But when you're opening restaurants and bars in California, that kind of goes hand in hand. When you're working with the stock brokers, that goes hand in hand. So mm -hmm. it was like I, I was trying to actually get on the up and up. But um, so when I was diagnosed, I, I basically went and told a friend, I said, hey, I'm going to go steal a Ferrari, rob a bank, drive to Mexico, because I was living in San Diego at the time, it was close, and mm -hmm. I said, uh, I'm just going to live a wild life until I either get, you know, hunted down or uh, until I die of cancer, because I just said, screw it, screw it. 
So I also had this cavalier attitude my whole life. I still do. Um, but my friend had told me, he said, hey, why don't you uh, ease up on sitting around watching your 80,000-inch TV that no one else has, not even a sports bar. Uh, stop ordering a pizza every night. Quit drinking four bottles of whiskey every night. Lay off the cocaine. Try to hang out with one woman at a time or maybe just take a break from all of them for a little while. Find your center. Do a cleanse. Go take some mushrooms or something and, and open yourself up to another way of looking at the world. And uh, for whatever reason, I, I said, okay, I'll try that. I'll give it a couple of weeks. If that doesn't work, then I'm going for the Ferrari and I'm out of here robbing the bank. So um, I, I took him up on his advice. And uh, it led me to having a, uh, an NDE, a near-death experience, where wow. for, for the first time in my life, I actually felt connected. Wow. Yeah. And how, how did that near-death experience transpire? Well, I went and bought myself an apple in a Snickers bar and a bottle of water, and I ate a handful of mushrooms, and I did what he said. I walked out into, the, into nature, and... Uh, all of a sudden, I'm walking along, and I'm like, whoa, 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 what's going on here? And, and this big light came out of the sky that I, for me anyway, big light came out of the sky, beamed me in the head, and basically said, hey, Leo, you're a lovable person. And I basically went back and saw my childhood, saw me growing up. I saw me from a different perspective. I was like, wow, look at this little kid. He's not a bad guy. Like, you know, he did the best he could. Yeah. And um, I kind of link that to what the only things I knew about quote unquote spirituality or religion at the time, a little Buddha flew by, a cross flew by, and all these different things. I was like, whoa, what's going on? And uh, then it was like aliens and UFOs and all this stuff sort of blended together and it opened up my mind to like, hey, maybe there's something else out there worth exploring. And um, I'd always had a interest in revolutionary models, you know, I had read the autobiography of Malcolm X at a very young age. I was a huge fan of what uh, transpired during the birth of our nation, you know, the United wow. States. Uh, not so much a huge fan of everything afterwards, but the birth of our nation, I thought was a very magical time. Um, and I and I was always kind of interested a little bit in, like, I'd seen Deepak Chopra on TV and... Uh -huh. You know, I'd been at home like three o'clock in the morning, drunk, looking at Tony Robbins infomercials that were on at the time, you know, and and uh, I was always kind of interested in that stuff. But after that experience, I was like, I just devoured it. I devoured it. And when I left high school, I told you I left when I was 15, never went back. My guidance told her, counselor had told me, she said, you're the kind of person who's going to invent a better mousetrap. And you would never make it in the military. You'd never make it uh, in a in a job where you got to follow the rules because it's just not your personality type. And uh, I really believed that that was true when she told me that. It really actually validated some ways that I felt about things. So when I started diving into the Tony Robbins, Deepak stuff, having cancer at the time, sure. I told myself, I said, you know what? I'm going to create a better system than these guys have got because my life's on the line. I feel extremely motivated right now. And um, I, I saw something that was missing, missing. And what was missing was a way to apply this stuff after you studied it. It was like, hey, sure, you could sit there and meditate for 10 hours a day or visualize for 10 hours a day or, or you know, say affirmations or whatever. But to me, that was, that was like, that's not part of my day-to-day -day life. I, who has to do that all day long? You know, it requires like living in a monastery or something. So I wanted to create a system that incorporated everything I was learning into something that would be easy that I could do every single day. And that's what led me to developing autobiographical feedback. Hmm. You know, I love that because often people read, you know, they read the books and they, you know, you have to do 20 minutes of meditation or, you know, get involved in hypnosis and, uh, and it's not achievable for many people and so they can it can easily be dismissed uh, because it's too too much for people to do and so rather than taking it in bite-sized chunks you know like you're 
you have a sip of tea, you don't take it <laughs> in one big gulp. You just do little sips of it, don't you? So that you can enjoy it and savour it and uh, uh, and enjoy the flavour of it and try different flavours and stuff like that. And and it's it's breaking it down often, isn't it, into manageable sips um, that you are going to enjoy. So you you pick your own flavour of, of tea, what, what you want to drink, rather than feel like it's a mandated, this is how you do it. So it's it's tailoring it to suit your personal needs. Is that what you found you yourself doing, is taking the learning, or was it, was it more than that? No, because I'm a very uh, mechanics-driven person, and, um, you know, something else that I realised that... Uh, struck me kind of after the NDE because I was raised on TV uh, that there was two TV shows that really like meant something to me. It was Kung Fu and Star Trek. So okay. I realized like, wow, like my identity is kind of like woven into these two TV shows almost like this futuristic technological thing. And then this ancient, like find your power from within and harness your chi type of thing. two things. Right. So, when I was hearing all the mythical stuff from, you know, uh, the Ayurvedic tradition coming back to India, which was very fascinating to me, I saw the mechanics in it. And when I would hear the fluffy stuff about, um, you know, visualization and so forth, I understood the mechanics of like neural associative conditioning and applied neuroplasticity. When I would hear people talking about vibration and, and emotional uh, intelligence, I began to get interested in seeing the, the mechanics of cellular regeneration and how receptor sites could absorb uh, chemicals, peptides and transmitters from the hypothalamus. I said, wait a second, there's got to be a way to actually create a system where this works for me. And what I realized was, is that from the work of like Dr. Candace Pert or uh, Bruce Lipton, that when every time we have a thought or every time we have an emotion, we have all these messenger molecules that shoot throughout the body and they're trying to attach to the cell walls. But if we don't have those receptor sites, they're just going to bounce off. But what does happen is because of those extra peptides and transmitters hitting the cell walls, when that cell dies, it tells the next cell to be born with more of those receptor sites to absorb what it couldn't get the last time. So it's if there's a generational um, conversation that has. So then as I, as I realized that, I said, okay, well, looking at like tipping point, critical mass, 100th monkey, I realized, all right, if we, if we have about 6,200 thoughts a day, I need to get to a critical mass of my thinking. My thoughts have got to change by 20% is a safe number. If I get 20% of my thoughts to change, 20% of my emotions to change, I'll get 20% of my cellular biology to change that means my consciousness will change. So what kind of consciousness do I want to create? And how can I ensure that I'm going to be able to change 20% of my thoughts, not only in the moment, but long term? How can I hire, hardwire a new neural network with a new story? So I invented new language. And the new language I adopted from principles of something called gematria. Gematria goes back to the origins of language. And a lot of people will say that the Kabbalistic tradition or the Torah or aspects of this, uh, the, the reasons why Jamashri was designed, because it actually blends with the mathematics of the universe and the fact that we live in something like a simulation. So they use math and they use language, they use vibration to actually code stories that were timeless and, and that were eternal into the Torah, understanding the aspects of sacred ge geometry, the symbolism, that platonic solids and they would build that out into the tree of life and this is a very complex science so i said let me understand that science and blend it with what we know about applied neuroplasticity and epigenetics and cellular regeneration so i can create a new language based on those same principles but it applies to our current day and age so that's what i did it sounds very complex and it is very complex in its nature but it's very easy to learn so yeah. So for me, I see thousands of messages every day that I programmed into my environment and the number of signs and symbols. And because I see those, they fire and wire new pathways inside of my brain. 
because I have encoded emotional responses, healing responses into those, it creates a longevity response and a healing response inside of my body. And I mean, the other day we had a party on Friday night, we had a party and uh, one of the guys who was here, he's a professional motocross rider. And he says, uh, and he was also the personal assistant for Warner Earhart, the man who's, who created okay. and landmark. And he says, yeah, I took Leo out, uh, riding the other day and he's like man the guy rides like a teenager man he's like i don't know what the heck he's doing and uh another guy is an international polo player he's like hey i took a horseback ride and the guy got onto it like this you know and i'm i'm i went to go meet with my boxing coach this morning and then i trained afterwards and then surfing it's like in my 50s i feel like i'm in my 20s and i'm certain that has to do with the chemicals flowing through my body through where my focus is at my belief systems um the regenerative and longevity practices that I do, breathing, uh, meditation, the uh, intermittent fasting, the non-carb, non-sugar diet for the most part. Yeah. But maybe I think it's belief because yeah. it's the same thing with other people and they'd be like, oh, this sucks. But for me, I'm like, woo, you know, like I'm feeling on fire. <laughs> and what was it, obviously when you, when you went down this path, you obviously got diagnosed with cancer and you, and you chose to listen to your friends. You had a magic mushroom experience, and you and you saw the light. And then you started getting deep into the work. What was the what was the biggest shift for you in the context of changing not only your mindset because it often starts with mindset and belief, but also changing the state of your cancer that was growing inside of you? Because we all have cancers growing inside of us. Um, just some get out of control and often it is a result of past trauma as depends on who you talk to uh, but unaddressed past trauma which is um, mentioned by many people in the trauma space such as um, his name's just popped out of my head um, I'll, it'll come back to me but um, obviously you mentioned you had ch childhood trauma um, but how did what were the key steps that you took or the biggest differentiator in, in the context of your healing journey? Well, I think the biggest thing, well, there's several for sure. Uh, one of them was understanding that uh, my thoughts are the origin, that, that mind is primary, matter is secondary, that where my energy goes, my attention is going to flow and my reality is going to grow. So I realized, okay, if I got to deal with my mind first, so I looked at it from, um, actually, I didn't look at it from the perspective of healing past traumas mm -hmm. because I was a 25-year-old egotistical guy. I mean, I was like, traumas aren't going to bother me. I'm a man, like whatever, you know. I don't think anybody really does, you know, female or male. We don't think about it in that context at 25 because we think we're invincible. <laughs> yeah, maybe more nowadays. I think people are... Well, who knows nowadays? Who knows nowadays? But uh, not to be a contrarian. But um, so that next day, what I didn't tell you was I started my first 30 day master cleanse the next day. I didn't even know what a master cleanse was. Oh, wow. I okay. just knew the next day I'm not supposed to eat. Like, I'm, I need to start doing things like Jesus did. Like, I got to, like, go into the wilderness and deal with whatever's inside of me that I need to deal with that I saw last night during my experience. And I also got super clear that, man, I want to manage the direction of my thoughts and the quality of my emotions like now, like immediately. Let me get a hold of the quality of my thoughts or the direction of my thoughts and follow my emotions immediately because I could see that that was the, basically the, metabolic outbirth of all of the other issues I was having in my life. That became super clear to me. Now, when I say I didn't consciously go to address traumas, because I started that 30-day fast that next day, mm -hmm. literally nothing but water with some lemon juice and some mm -hmm. cayenne and a little bit of maple syrup. And I think I stumbled upon that like maybe a week or so in. I just was doing nothing at first. All of a sudden, I'd be, and I started meditating, and within a month, I had, I had uh, sold that business I told you when I was 25. I sold that business. I ended up moving it into a, uh, a shrine that was nearby where they meditated three times a day, and they practiced martial arts. So I was a new Shadeshi, a living student. My whole life just changed. Everyone who knew me was wow. like, 
What happened to the cocaine? Where's the women? What the hell are you doing? Like, it was incredible. It was incredible how much just instant change. But one of the things that I noticed as I was doing this process is I would be in the middle of meditation. All of a sudden, tears would start coming down. And I'd realize, like, all of these pains that I'd had inside that I'd been, like, holding down and, and trying not to pay attention to that just began to surface incredibly. And also the people I'd hurt, not, not, not because I was trying to hurt people, but just because normal, not normal, normal for me, selfish, young, egotistical, I'm going to succeed at whatever cost type of stuff. That I was like, yeah, whatever, that's what people do. I realized, like, wow, that's not what people really should be doing. You know, I don't want to be like this anymore. And to really go through this process of like crying for the first time in my life wow. for, for months, like every other day or every couple, three days or something, all of a sudden this whole thing would come over me and just this wash. And as I cried, I could feel like cancer chemicals leaving my body. I remember I was just like, wow, this is what I've been holding on to. All of this hurt, this abandonment, this never being supported, this not being wanted, this trying to prove myself um, by some super superficial methodology, not understanding that that I'm lovable as I am, you know, that yeah. actually taking a break and how can I help other people would be maybe a good idea. Um, lots of stuff like that was coming up. and. Yeah. It wasn't a planned approach. It just kind of happened. It just happened. Yeah. And, and I love that you mentioned that because we kind of, you know, we when you grow up in a hardened environment, you, you crying is seen as a sign of weakness. Uh, and it still is in some parts, isn't it, that it, you need to hold back the tears and not cry. Um, and, it, and you use it when, depending on the environment you're in, as a protectionist space, you know, to protect yourself. But obviously when you find that, element of psychological safety where you can do that deep inner work that having the opportunity to cry is so important um yeah. because like you say you can feel the negative chemicals leaving your body because that is exactly what it's supposed to do that's our that's exactly what crying is designed to do is to get the cortisol out of your system and yeah. all of the chemicals that are not meant to be there it's a cleansing uh, approach that's just brilliant but only if we use it and if we hold it in and we don't give ourselves the permission to cry as, you know I like to say it's okay to cry baby rather than the saying that's often don't be a cry baby it's okay to cry oh, nice. um, you know we we have that huge sense of relief don't we it, at, at a cellular level as, as well as emotional um, level and a, a mental level like you mentioned, of all the thoughts that you know, you you could just let the tears almost wash wash that negativity away. So you I know, think it's so important. Some of these things, um, I wish we had a more modern, up to date, accepted manual for the human body. Because I was talking to someone who's very close to me the other day. Uh, a young woman. I live in the Dominican Republic right now, and, this, and down here, family is very, 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 very important. I would say it's more important than it is where I come from in the states. Not just speaking from my own perspective, having I mean, a quote-unquote kind of disconnected home, but I think for most families, communities are tighter here than they are in the United States for sure, on average. Mm -hmm. um, but her mother had just passed, and I know she was so close with her mother, and. She would she wouldn't cry. She was trying to hold it back. And I could see as I was looking, I was like, listen, the amount of pain that you must be feeling right now, and you're trying to be strong, and there's no reason to try to be strong. And she's telling me that her hair's her hair was turning white and she's in her twenties. Actually wow. she's 30. And uh, her hair was turning white before her mom passed. She knew that her mom was in bad shape. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I was talking to her and I was thinking like, you're going to give yourself cancer if you don't get this stuff out. Like, get it out. Like, give yourself permission to cry. She says she's not even going to go to the funeral. She's already made, I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, go go through this grieving process. Mm. 
And it's so odd to me. Again, this goes back to the original question of what do I think is the best for uh, you know health, a healthy brain, and that's understanding who we are in relationship to our environment. Mm. And reality's made an agreement. Everything's a collective agreement. I mean, even Max Planck, when he won the Nobel Prize in 1917, told everybody like the only told the scientific community the only reason you're sitting in those chairs is because inside we've created neurons to say those chairs are real. So now those probabilities have amplified, and we're sitting in these chairs. And <laughs> I think we we really need a manual that, that says you want to live longer, then here's what you need to do. Quit eating 17,000 calories a day, free up your digestive system. Understand this very simple concept that if you free up that energy, it's going to be regenerative. Instead of digesting a bunch of unnecessary junk, it's going to go back and fix a bunch of things that will keep you alive longer. If you're holding on to emotions that are traumatic, let them out or your body's going to be, you know, using a certain amount of energy to keep those emotions down. Yeah. And it's incredibly energy intensive to deal with um, toxins that sit inside your body, whether, whether that's toxic thoughts or toxic chemicals um, or toxic food. And I don't think we necessarily fully appreciate or, or recognize how consuming holding on to that toxicity can be uh, and what the consequences long term can be. And obviously for yourself, you experienced it firsthand that it manifests in, in tumor growth. Yeah. Um, for some people, it can manifest in other chronic diseases for others, but often for people, um, it, it can manifest in, in the growth of tumors because we haven't allowed our bodies to let go of the tox toxins that we have what in whatever format that may be in i think the first sign of a over toxified body mind is a reactive nature and a uh -huh. and a an awareness that we are projecting more than we're listening i think that's part of that reactive nature because there's not a there's not a flow going on, and currently I I attempt to do about two vipassanas per year, which are these silent retreats where you go in and you just decompress the mind, and it gets you into a, a very solid creative response and a non-reactive response, and I've noticed that when we have a short fuse or a short temper. All that is is the bubbling up of this toxicity because we're like a canary in a mine shaft that has learned to adapt to a certain level of toxicity, but we don't have good uses or way to truly deal with the roots of that toxicity. I think that playing the guitar or going for a walk or doing the dishes is our meditation, but I think we really need to take a look at how do we really – not, not wipe the surface, but get into the roots and the origins of where this overwhelm begins to build up inside of the body. And what I found is, you know, Vipassana meditation, after doing many, many, many styles, it's what, um, and I'm not, you know, nobody makes any money or gets any props for talking about Vipassana, but the work that's involved is what qualifies it for me. It's real work. I mean, it's not an easy thing where you put down incense so you can smell something while you put on music so you can hear something while you do a visualization so you can see. No, you're, none of that stuff counts. You're actually scanning your body and releasing the traumas that are inside of it. Yeah. And, and it's amazing how you can come across these things stored in every different part of your body, things that you, like, you totally forgot. Like, wow, that's why I have this pain in my hip. Every time I scan, I go past my hip, my mom comes up or something, you know, or this mm. event comes up. And I think that uh, it's also interesting when I talk to people, a lot of people about longevity, they say, I don't want to live that long. <laughs> really? <laughs> like, if someone would say, you want to die tomorrow? They'd be like, hell no, I don't want to die tomorrow. Well, at what day are you going to say you don't want to live that long? <laughs> yeah. Know? <laughs> so our frame of reference on how we value our life and how we value the quality of that life 
you know, a lot of times I think I've done like 20 something Vipassanas in four different countries in the last 10 years, right? And uh, people are like, man, like, I don't see how you could do it. It's like, how I could do it? Like, you have to, the question that you have to ask yourself is how good can you manage your life? Can you imagine your life to be? Because every time I go in there, I'm releasing all of this more stuff that just makes me feel that much more vibrant and alive and creative, you know? Like, yeah. I don't intend this for that. And, you know, yeah. let me do one in Egypt. I'll go visit the Great Pyramid afterwards. Or let me go to Machu Picchu and do one in Peru. And then I'll go, you know, like, wow, you know? Yeah. Certainly, if I didn't do the Vipassana, then I went to Machu Picchu, I would have a completely more stressful experience. Yeah. For yeah. sure. Yeah, I can I can completely relate to what you're describing. I don't do it to the to the depth of um, that you mentioned, but when when we use havening to help let go of trauma, um, which is a psychosensory technique, we use the power of human touch. Um, it's incredibly um, helpful in allowing you to process and let go of go of those traumas. And and you know you mentioned that how we can store it in our bodies. And, and it was Gabor Mate and Bessel van der Valk who, who's done the work on trauma and how our body can keep score. And I've personally experienced it in the context of um, giving birth as a C-section. I was not able to um, have the contractions that I needed to have as part of the natural experience. And I had a lot of pain in my lower back from, probably from the epidural. And I felt like kind of disconnected from myself after have, having the um, C-section. So I did some deep work on the trauma and I asked my um, husband to, to stroke the scar where, where I had the C-section and did the havening. And I ended up experiencing the contractions two years after wow. um, having the baby wow. that I never had, um, which was which for people might sound quite freaky outy, but it after that experience, I felt much more whole again because my body was and my mind were holding on to what I was not able to process at the time. And I think a lot, a lot of us, uh, in the context of trauma, and you, you know, you mentioned it, I, our body. In order to manage the trauma psychologically, we hold on to it physically in our bodies. We don't necessarily have the capacity to hold on to it in our minds. So our body holds on to it. And, and when we don't tap into how we can release it, that trauma becomes an epicenter of potential self-destruction in the future. And I know you mentioned, obviously, you weren't, um, you were, were a baby that wasn't wanted is you would have experienced all the chemical inputs from your mother whilst you were growing in the womb uh, to tell you that you weren't wanted so you would have had high levels of cortisol and all of the negative stress hormones that are generated to chemically tell you as a baby that was growing um, before you even emerged in the world you would have had that encoding to say uh, I'm disconnected from my mum, in a way. And then obviously you, you experienced that throughout your early childhood and fortunately for you, um, we're able to to process that through the the practices that you, you developed and, uh, and, and, and help yourself heal from, from the cancer. When did you find out that you um, were able to, when did you find out that your cancer had disappeared? How long did it take between starting your journey to finishing that? Well, it was uh, 29 years ago. I never went back for a second opinion. <laughs> but did you notice, when did the pain go away? Did you not, not even get it reevaluated? No, I, I, I told myself, you know, I'll go in for a diagnosis and I'll deal with it from there. If the pain starts going away, I'll keep doing what I'm doing. And I, I honestly, no offense, I don't trust doctors a whole heck of a lot, especially 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, my grandfather kind of, he was my primary mentor, my grandfather, my primary caregiver. And he was a huge advocate of 
don't let me die in a nursing home. Let me die alongside of the trail like the American Indians did. Let me die with some respect, you know. Um, I don't trust those guys. And sure enough, he passed away because he was told that he may need a stint. And then there was complications in the surgery one time when he was totally fine. And he died. So oh, it's kind of, you know. And uh, there's a lot of that that happens. I'm sure you know. Uh, I think yeah. The number two cause of death, I think, is uh, medical intervention. I'm pretty sure that's the number two cause of death. Mm. I don't accurate. know the statistics on that, but I'm sure there's a lot of um, lack of intervention that also causes death because the or the wrong intervention. Yeah. Um, because we've lost that connection to empowering ourselves, I think. Um, We're very complex. No, I'm just going to say I'd love to dive into that because I know you talked about that earlier. Is this that we have this enormous power inside of us that you know over the years as med medicine has evolved, we've kind of lost sight of the fact that we have this ability to heal from the inside out. Um, I'd love you to, if, if you wouldn't mind expanding on that from your own personal experience and and the and the protocols that you now use. Yeah. So. We know that uh, Hoffman Maroche, this pharmaceutical company, makes uh, interleukin-2 as an example. So we also know that that mirrors, or is supposed to mirror, interleukin that's you know, created in thymus gland behind the heart. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, what do we need to do to create interleukin? What needs to happen? You know, if I go horseback riding, I have a blast, so I start creating interleukins. If I go motorcycle riding and I'm having you know, a great time doing a couple of jumps, am I creating interleukins? If I'm surfing and drop into a big wave or come out of the water and hanging out with a bunch of friends and we're laughing and telling stories about the weekend party we had at my creating interleukins, probably, you know, uh, a big sign of cancer is that you're unhappy. In fact, I think there was a, a mind body test from Harvard Medical School in the late 90s, I believe it was, where they realized that it wasn't whether people were vegetarian, whether they drank, whether they smoked. It was really, they enjoy their job, and were they happy? And most people who had a job they didn't like, spending 40-plus hours working, plus the amount of time driving there, plus the amount of time thinking about going back to work, that occupies most of your damn day. So if most of your damn thoughts are negative, you're unhappy. Yeah. So really getting clear on, you know, like my, my wife, she's an attorney, and her, doc, her sister's uh, – I think she's the number one rated oncologist here in the country mm -hmm. and not interested in my approach, and which is fine. Uh, and I'm not here to help people be cured of cancer. Uh, my, my mission is something different. But I certainly believe that the first thing we should deal with is the 6,200 on average thoughts we have each day and controlling the direction of those thoughts and the quality of those emotions is their base that's your base for dealing with cancer, you know, in my opinion, uh, which that includes what's your external environment, the types of sensory cues that are coming in that are creating those thoughts and emotions. Um, how do we shift your internal environment, your physiology, whether it's the foods that you're eating or the thoughts and emotions that you're having, but to really start to gain control over that first as your base before looking at anything too invasive or atrophying the thymus gland because you're taking so much interleukin too that your thymus says, hey, I don't need to make any interleukin. Let me shut down. You know, understand that there's these ancillary effects that can happen when we are not stimulating the lymphatic system to pump toxicities out, to do that deep, deep diaphragmatic breathing in order to bring more free radical scavengers in, uh, to do the intermittent fasting increases growth hormone levels or bring the hormones into balance so that we can have this optimum circadian rhythms and fradian rhythms. We have 976 known biological rhythms that are organized by the pituitary and pineal gland. When those rhythms are in sync and working properly, we produce more growth hormones and our hormonal levels in general balance out. There's so many things to take care of and address before looking at some type of medical intervention, medical intervention, other than, uh, Let's deal with your thoughts. Let's deal with your emotions. Let's deal with your diet. Let's deal with your, your happiness rating. Let's deal with, you know, what are your focus 40 plus hours a week? Are you doing something to contribute? Are you creating that serotonin by noticing a gift exchange? Are you focusing on people you dislike? Are we taking into awareness the effect of the diagnosis? 
how does that impact the emotions that we have where our thoughts go? You know, are we including the placebo, nocebo effect? Yeah. When someone says, hey, we're going to get your test results back to you in a week or so, it's like that next week or so could create cancer. Yeah, yeah. Do you know, I totally, I absolutely uh, agree with you on all of those facts. It just ties back into the five pillars that I use uh, in the framework that I have is that the, your feelings, your actions, your connections, your thoughts and your surroundings. And, and it often... You know, the two, like you mentioned, the two fundamentals to look at initially is is your feelings, your emotions that, that you're having and how are they being generated through the thoughts that you're having in any uh, aspect of your surroundings and your connections that are causing you to, to feel the way you feel and, the, and think the way you're thinking. And and like you say, we, we don't tend to learn this. You know, there's no one gives you this instruction manual to say... <laughs> Uh, how you can get the best out of you from a internal power perspective before, like you say, having the, the medical intervention that we so often in today's world, not historically, but reach for, you know, a, 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 pill, a pill a day will keep keep the, the illness away is, is not, is not, is not generally how it works. It's normally a pill a day uh, will keep your illness going. <laughs> Because you're not addressing the, the root cause. Right. Um, and it's so important. And I'd love to dive into your um, autobiographical uh, um, feed, feedback that you do. Um, and I know you've talked about it a little bit, but what makes it so different to other approaches that are out there? What, what's the real differentiator um, for you? Well, there's, there's nothing else out there even like it uh, to begin with. So let me, I can run you through a, a brief example. I've got students in uh, three different programs. So I have a series called The Language of Enlightenment, which is a three-part mm -hmm. series. And one of my students is from South Africa, uh, mm -hmm. uh, a woman uh, getting up there in age who has cancer. And I connected with her. And the first thing we started working on, it wasn't one-on-one. -on -one. She's in the, you know, our group class. Yeah. Our first program, we begin to create a very clear idea of who are we here to be and what are we here to experience in our life. So most people, if you were to say, who, who, who are you here to be? They're like, well, uh, well uh, they're not going to write off the bat like, hey, this is exactly who I'm here to be. This is my stand. What are you here to create? Very few people know. Well, that's crazy to me. Yeah. Well, you know that... Every single day, these 6,000 thoughts that we're putting out are creating our tomorrow. If we're not, like, watching where these things are going every day, we're just going to – so many things will be happening to us. We're in a constant state of reaction instead of a constant state of creation. Yeah. So first is organizing that intelligence internally. And then the second part is starting to build that intelligence externally. So what makes my program different? Well, right now, more – People who run the world and are people who run the world, the elitist one percent, uh, who are controlling everything for the most part, between computer-generated algorithms, political agendas, corporate narratives, technological uh, pushes that are trying to get us to go in certain directions. To, in my opinion, try food to consumption. food consumption. Yeah, you it just junk everywhere. So. If we were to use any technology to control our behavioral patterns, to control our thoughts, to control our emotions, the same way that these algorithms are used in social media, uh, if we were to use those on ourselves to actually move us towards the life of our dreams, then we have a fighting chance. Because first of all, those will be in competition with the algorithms and marketing and agendas and narratives that are out there. Yeah. So I have designed a marketing campaign for my own personal heaven on earth that I see every single day. Now, I live in the Caribbean. Here's my view right here, right? So very nice. I am I am not surrounded by strip malls and billboards and all sorts of junk that you would see in you know first world countries. And I'm here for that's part of the reason. I'm not interested in any of that stuff. But if I were, I would be seeing messages constantly that would have that have an impact on me. Yeah. Hundred percent. So when I did live in that environment, and now, I have a, 
a completely different marketing campaign, again, as I mentioned before, that leverages these sacred technologies of mnemonics and gematria and blends them with the sophisticated technologies we use with the neuro linguistic program, neural associative conditioning, mm -hmm. psycholinguistics, timeline therapy, mm -hmm. all of that that's built into our marketing, I use on me. So when I went to the gym this morning, I passed by a symbol, an ancient platonic symbol, an ancient Jewish symbol. That both of those symbols are the same symbol, but that symbol means rebirth. It means resurrection. And it's an octagon. Not a lot of people know that that platonic solid, that uh, uh, copalistic geometric shape means rebirth. Well, when I see this stop sign, I have programmed into that who I'm here to be. And every time I see that, I, I also, based on what we know about psychoneuroimmunology and psychoneuroendocrinology and the power that our belief system has, I believe that that sacred symbol also carries that resurrection, rebirth power in it. So when I see it and I declare to myself, I, Leonidas, Brittany, Treadwell, see, hear, feel, and know that the purpose of my life is to be the best that I can be and to share myself courageously and compassionately with the world. And I see this timeline shoot out in front of me for the things I'm expected to do this next year based on quarterly markers. I see all that because I program my mind to be able to stack that much information with the computation power of my brain and the storage capacity within my cells. And that's what I teach. Uh, do you know, I love that. And, uh, you know, you remind, it reminds me of something simple that my daughter said. and Because um, we were listening to some music on the radio and um, she heard a particular song and she said, Mummy, that reminds me of our trip to the Lake District. Exactly. And, you know, and all of the sensory, you know, we've got five exactly. senses that we always are tapping into subconsciously exactly. and but often they push us into thinking back in our past experiences but but what you're doing is tapping into the senses and helping us envisage our future state rather than just our past state so no, kind of kind of this okay. so, let me give an example <laughs> let me give an example so I could have a very negative association to the memories of my childhood. Absolutely, of course you can. <laughs> or I could recondition those, give new meanings to them, and then create anchors externally that reinforce those new meanings. Yeah. So it's also a tool for healing traumas. Yeah, so that's exactly what we do, what I do with my clients, is to rewrite and create new meanings and new inputs that positively reframe the past experience and you can either do it living into it or positioning yourself as a director of it uh, and looking at how you want to change um, change that memory if okay. you want to change it at all. So let me, let me show you what's different then because this is going to be disruptive to this industry and you you are going to have to adopt what I'm about ready to tell you. Okay? <laughs> Neurons are prepared together, wired together, right? Of course, yeah, they do. So if you create a breakthrough with somebody, where they're rewriting a script, giving a new meaning, unless that's reviewed more frequently than the memory, that memory is going to eventually, it will always still be there unless that pattern is completely rewritten. So if you told your client, hey, listen, every time you drive by a uh, stop sign, when you come to a stop, I want you to rewrite that script, feel the feelings, see that new version of yourself emote into that story, rewrite that timeline, keep redoing it, redoing it, redoing it, every time you see a stop sign. Why? Because you want that pattern to be solid. Solid. The, the therapy that we give each other or going to a Tony Robbins event or whatever, that's like a, oftentimes, more times than not, it's like a suntan, it begins to fade away after a while. Yeah, yeah. Certainly we can remember that, oh yeah, I do have this other meaning, but, are, but is it really like embodied completely? Is that neural network completely rewired? Did the old one atrophy? Does it mean thank you, mom? Because if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be who I am, who I am here today. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much. And God bless you. And I'm sorry that had to happen to you and all this stuff. Who cares about me? I'm an adult. I'm conscious. I know how to deal with all this stuff. You didn't. Yeah. My heart goes yeah. out for you. Yeah. You know? Do you know, I, I, I want to push you there on that one because I totally agree when you when we're told to rewrite it, um, we have to keep revisiting it. Otherwise, the 
the neural network that we already have does it still still exists like you say we've still got that neural network in our mind but, but if you were to associate it let's say to a stop sign right yeah yeah there's a new path that interrupts that and it goes to something okay. else and exactly. begins yes so you're not trying to rewire the same path that's there no, with a new creating, open, a new one. creating a new one that loops back around to something on the other side of the brain linked to number signs or symbols that has nothing to do with the emotional context and the language and the memory. Yes. Yeah, but you, like you say, with everything within our brain, we will prune what we don't use. So if we don't use it, it gets pruned out. Right. right. Uh, and if the, if, the, if the neural network of our trauma is very strong, it's like having a motorway versus a small track that you've just you've just cut down to create a new a new route. So you so your motorway stays but your track gets overgrown and gets 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 lost. But here's the interesting thing with with the havening approach is that if you have a trauma um, and you have uh, the way that trauma is encoded is you have um, is encoded through AMPA receptors on the surface of your brain cell and think of a ring on your finger, what you can do with the trauma is actually through the generation of delta waves, which they do with EMDR as well, is you literally take away the AMPA receptor that links to the encoding across the rest of your brain, put it back in the brain cell. So there is no longer ever going to be the connector to the pathways that you historically had that related to that trauma. So you, you, you break the link uh, and you break the trauma. So a lot of people can't ever recall the experience in the same way that they had it because they've completely removed, in some instances, depends on the complexity of the trauma, but they've completely removed the AMPA receptor that encoded the trauma in the, in the first place. And another topic of discussion, but it's super, super in exciting how we can change the networks in our mind it's through true. reprogramming uh, and interventions that we're not even scratching the surface of really uh, from a human kind perspective that we we is so inbuilt within us and accessible from birth so yeah again you know if we're doing it, if we can do up to 100 billion computations per second and uh, it's sad, in my opinion, because unless we really make some massive differences in how, in how we view ourselves soon, because it's like if you ask Gen X kids right now or Gen Z or whatever the recent one is, is, uh, you know, what's seven times nine? A lot of them be like, I don't know. Pull out your phone and take a look. Right. Well, that's embarrassing. If you were to ask them, you know, what are the three fundamental reasons the constitution was written when i was a kid everybody knew to protect liberty to protect uh to protect liberty to, to protect us from foreign uh invasion foreign and domestic and to protect our currency three reasons nobody now nobody knows now why it was written they don't know why i have to google it <laughs> that's yeah that it's called the computer and that can be manipulated and it's really obvious google has been manipulated a lot so what's the deal is it now we have chat gpt the idea is if you can ask it the right questions, you can get whatever answer you're looking for. Well, the same thing with the human brain. If you ask it the right questions, the answers are there. Yeah. We are tapping into this universal consciousness. We already are singularity. We're just desensitized to it. You know, we haven't awakened our senses enough to realize we're connected to everything. So, uh, you know what? It's interesting. It's an interesting time that we're living in, for sure. And it's not something we don't want to be looking up and paying attention to. It's something we should really collectively come together and, and ask and have a bigger conversation. Yeah. Uh, but we'll yeah, see. No, I, I, I love that, and I totally agree. And, you know, it comes back to connection, doesn't it, is that we, we have the power to make a huge difference if we all work together and, and connect and, and bring a, a collective solution that's that's going to help everybody but we can't do that if we work if we work in isolation and if if we don't take the time to do the deep work in and to look at how we can connect better to the world around us and to the people around us that can really support us and 
and, and with that in mind, Leo, what one piece of advice would you give to anyone who's really struggling with that internal, deep internal connection that they felt were missing, which is where you start the conversation that you never really felt you were connected? Right. Well, the longest, the longest study on happiness has been done at Harvard University. I believe they've had four or five different professors there passing on this baton. And again, going back to this idea that reality is made in agreement. You know, we have 8 billion people on the planet, each one sending out 6,000 thoughts a day. That's a total of 48 trillion threads that we're weaving tomorrow with. 48 trillion seeds that we're planting to harvest for tomorrow. And 48 trillion prayers that we're sending out. I think we forget that most people these days are looking for pleasure. They're looking for that, that, that dopamine bump, whether it's through a social media like or pornography or a drink or whatever, instead of understanding that what we really seek is happiness. And happiness is simple. Most of that, as we can see from this study from Harvard University, is community. And, you know, I think it would be very difficult. And, you know, I, right now I live in a community where there's people from all over the world. It's impossible almost for me to go have uh, coffee or tea on the beach in the morning and not see my friends from Russia, the Ukraine, France, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, uh, almost every country in Latin South America people from the U.S. and Canada, just when we sit down at our outdoor place and have coffee in the morning, and everybody knows everybody. I have people up from all over the world at my party Friday night. Yeah. And I get more happiness simply knowing I can go get out of the water, drive over from the gym, and just plug into that community each morning. And we don't want things. We want the feelings we think those things will give us. So understanding that it's not that difficult it's really not that difficult, but we don't have a manual. So if we had a manual, it would be a lot easier to say, hey, stop looking for things. Find the ways to make the, create the emotions. Understand how many emotions you have each day, how it's going to take to create a, a phase transition or a cascading effect to switch to a different emotional body. Start to work on that cellular regenerational process. Interrupt your pattern a certain number of times a day. And... Use the mechanics of biology, the mechanics of consciousness to create the internal and external environment that you want to have on the daily, on the regular. Yeah. I, do you know, I love that. And I think it's such an important fundamental aspect of our lives that we seem to have totally lost to a certain degree for, for many people is that, that understanding what they want emotionally uh, and using connection to to find a way to get it rather than things um, is so important. Leo, how can people get hold of you and learn about autobiographical feedback, all the work that you do from I'm a Matrix and so on? What's the best way for people to get hold of you? Super easy. Go to IamTheMatrix.com and sign up for the Language of Enlightenment series. Easy yeah. as well. And, and I, I, I just love your approach um so do make sure you check out leo's website do make sure you go and look him up um he's obviously got a absolute breadth and depth of experience on this topic and and his, his story has um been there to show you how leo it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show i think i could talk for hours with you. so thank you so so much for joining me uh, and remember this show is all about brain health unchaining your pain you are not stuck with the brain you have you have the power to change it and leo has been kindly here to show us how thanks leo i really hope you enjoyed that conversation thank you so much for listening please be sure to like and share this episode and leave a review on my website or on Apple Podcasts. If you're looking for opportunities to optimise your brain health or unchain your pain from a past trauma, make sure you visit my website www.ruthmaryallen.com and use the code PODCAST10 at checkout to get 10% off all programmes. And always remember, you are not stuck with the brain you have. You have the power to make it better. 
you have the power to unchain your pain and optimize your brain power and performance so that you can win back energy and time doing what you love. 